Hello and welcome to let me bore you to sleep dot com. My name is Jason Noland. Please only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes. <sighs> And this is Let Me Pull You to Sleep. So, the idea, the idea behind this podcast is, it's kind of like a, uh, what is it? Like two things, really, or three things. It's kind of uh, let me see how to explain this. It is for people to go to sleep, and for me to just be boring for you to go to sleep. It's also a mild entertainment perhaps a little bit and it's also a company a company for people and uh, I had someone recently say that I've had a few people actually say that they like to listen because it's nice to hear a friendly voice and kind of feel that um, I'm like a a distant friend kind of thing so hey yay um, and I got a headache <laughs> which isn't I don't know why I'm telling you that I just had, just took some tablets for my head I don't I don't normally get headaches but it's just uh I only re- I really noticed it when I sat down and started looking at my tablet. Not the tablet that I took for the headache, um, but the tablet, you know, the tablet, tablet, with the screen, with a very, very bright screen. A bit, a bit too bright, actually. Um, how do I turn the screen down? Where's the settings for this? Blimmin' thing sends screen display brightness pro no what it's pretty much at full so I'll turn it down a bit that's a bit better now I don't know where I was where was I oh that's it nope that can go 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 um oh now I've lost what I was doing. Oh. Okay, so what I'm going to do is. No, that's not what I want. It'd be much more interesting if you could see what I was doing. Well, not all the time, but you know. So. Uh, what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about chocolate. Because I thought it would be mildly fun to just talk about chocolate. (laughs) So there you go. So I'm just going to find a website that has facts about chocolate on it. And I'm just going to read you the facts. Oh, blimey. Oh, this is a slideshow. No, I don't like this. And it keeps resizing. Oh, no, I don't like that. don't like that website. Okay, so this is just a normal website. I have to accept before I go in. It's got a picture. This is www. 
swedishnomad.com forward slash facts dash about dash chocolate forward slash and the person that wrote this is called Alex Waltner and it says he's a Swedish nomad looks very happy though so he doesn't look like he's I don't know what a nomad is but he says um, hey my name is Alex and I'm a professional travel blogger and photographer from Sweden I'm currently on a mission to show you the amazing places and diversity that our planet has to offer oh, it's amazing nobody thought about doing that before isn't it because I've often wondered what other countries look like ok so there's a really lovely picture of a chocolate bar it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine um chunks. I don't you know, basically it's that you can break off. And it's like a chocolate basic chocolate bar. But on top of it it's got a few uh chocolate crumbs. Um probably cocoa, just like crumbled on top. Or, actually, look at it, it could be a flake, Cadbury's chocolate flake, crumbled. But like really quite finely crumbled, but it's hard to say. So I'm not going to read it vertretrim, you know, as it says the whole thing, because, you know, for photocopy, photocopy reasons, (laughs) for, um, you know, I don't want to... Don't want to get sued for all, all the millions of pounds that I don't have. So I'm just going to skim it a little bit and tell you a little bit what's on it. So what's the first, the first fun fact? Chocolate is made from cacao beans, and it says here many people aren't aware that their beloved chocolate where it comes from some know it comes from cacao cacao that sounds a bit like poo doesn't it but even fewer know where cacao is grown and how the beans are harvested oh it's a lovely picture here of a cacao fruit Uh, so it's grown inside a fruit and it kind of looks a little bit like actually the fruit itself looks quite nice it's like yellow and looks like it would be quite nice and you open it up and the insides it's a mixture it looks a bit like a like a little spider's uh, you know, when st- oh, I'll move on from that, but it, it's something out of Alien. But it's uh, at the same time, it also looks like garlic, like a garlic clove, because it's got covered in like white stuff. Um, so. Each fruit contains 20 to 40 cacao beans. So it's harvested, often harvested by hand. And the tree, the cacao tree, is native to Central America and South America. But apparently, to the, apparently according to this, it's more commonly grown in Africa these days. Okay, so... What's the other one? Number three, it takes about 900 cacao beans to make one kilo of chocolate. Now, one kilo is quite a lot, though, isn't it? No? God, I'm bored with this already. So, yeah, so I was... Uh, 
I prefer it when I can just close my eyes and talk. Look at that screen's doing my ear, my, not my ears, my eyes. Eyes better. I might have to continue talking about cacao beans another time. But I can't do it because I can't look at the screen. I literally cannot. I mean, it's kind of basic, isn't it? It's like... Although my headache's going a little bit now, but it's... Uh, it's my eyes need to rest. In fact, I'm going to take my glasses off. Because I don't need them on when my eyes are closed. Not really. Uh, could do with the light being off, but... Because even with my eyes closed, I can still see the light. Unless I put my hand over my eyes. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's that's lovely. Perhaps I need to get a little hat or something to shade my eyes from the light. Sometimes think that I'm kind of half vampire. I do. I what the other half is though. Half vampire, half stripper, I think. <laughs> half gigolo. So today, um, well, yesterday really, because today's now a new day. It's just gone two o'clock in the morning. Yesterday, the early hours of the morning, I was I made three recordings. So I did uh, "Let Me Boy You to Sleep." I did a deep sleep whisper hypnosis recording. I also did a relaxation hypnosis for stress, anxiety, and panic attacks. And that last one lasted for just under an hour. The whisper one lasted about half an hour. So, I guess, you know, I put quite a lot of uh, energy and time into these recordings. <clears throat> and um, so then I had, you know, I needed to do all the uploading, editing and all that stuff of each one which is a little bit time consuming sometimes because at the same time I was always doing some other stuff as well some other online web design stuff and I ended up going to bed about 8.30 in the morning which is a lot later than normal I'm normally in bed by 7, sometimes by 6, sometimes by 5, but you know, I'm never, never usually as late as 8.30 or 9 in the morning. That happens maybe once a month. And it was already, there was already people talking in the garden already at half 7. Um, so it was like, oh. But uh, so I went to bed. We've had really, really lo a lot of rain, wind, and non summery weather today or yesterday. Which meant that throughout the day, there probably wasn't anyone in the garden. And I slept all the way through till nearly seven o'clock in the evening. I really didn't know it was that late. It was, and because it was so like cloudy and like dull outside, I needed the light on. So I, <laughs> I literally got up and had to have the lights on. I was like, oh. 
So yeah, it's not a good idea. I'm gonna have to sort of uh, not do that. But sometimes I get so caught up in what I'm doing. So uh, I feel I'm like like the energized bunny, kind of really full of uh, focus and energy, and just want to get as much done as possible. And like, it's kind of like riding the wave. I, I kind of that's what I that's how I kind of describe it. I try and ride the wave. So when I get a wave of uh, real positivity and a real energy commitments um, I try and ride that wave and when there's a wave of negativity and feeling sorry for myself and stuff I try to um, allow that wave to go over me if that makes sense I kind of I kind of just kind of keep still if I can and wait until the till that one's gone by And then when another one comes along, another, you know, energy, positivity wave, I jump on that. And I'm not a surfer. Might surprise you to know that I'm not actually a surfer. So me riding the wave would probably... It's not so much surfing it because it's not, you know, it's not a literal wave of water, but it's, I suppose, it's like having the wind behind you. It's like me being the sail and the wind behind me and using the sail to get to where I want to get to. But when the wind's going in the opposite direction to where I want to go, I take the sail down so that I don't get affected by it. I think that makes sense. Kind of. That's probably a better analogy actually, really, maybe, than the wave. But then I'm not a sailor. But I have been on a boat. So I used to be in the sea cadets. So I've been in a boat, but I didn't... So I can't swim, or well, I'm not a... Swimming's not my speciality. And... Uh, I can swim a length of a, of a swimming pool. But, you know, I did learn, because I had a... Uh, kind of a weird experience when I was really little in a swimming pool and um, they had and I'm talking on this little little probably I don't know two or three I remember it vaguely but they had a wave machine in the pool now I don't I'm not sure if swimming pools have those anymore but this was a uh, quite a new thing I'm sure it's just kind of like a, a bit like a jacuzzi really just like a, a, a lot of pressure just making the water go choppy well you know I kind of didn't know what was happening and, and I was ended up being dragged out and rescued well ever since then I've not really um being able to kind of hold hands with with water, if you know what I mean. I just so when I was what nine, I actually had swimming lessons for maybe a year at school. So every it might have been once a week or twice a week. I don't know. And I'd have me paddles, but you know the what do they call it? The arm flaps, you know, the the blow up inflatable things that you put on your arms. So I used to have them, and I still would. 
If I could go into a swimming pool with those on, or have the, you know, like the board that floats, like, like, like polystyrene board or whatever, and be able to sort of have that under my body or hold on to that and swim, then I possibly, possibly would have continued, you know, as an adult doing that, but seems that that's only allowed for beginners for some reason just like I think that uh, with bicycles I could have quite liked to have had stabilizers left on my bike because if nothing else it's a stand isn't it your bike just stands up on its own don't know why they had to be taken off I remember saying to my dad why why are you taking the stabilizers off he said you're 25 I said there's no reason he said yes it is I said oh okay he said uh, one more thing I said what he said I think you need to find somewhere else to live oh, come on dad he said, and you need to get a job. Oh, I'm only young. He said, you're 25. I know. But you've got three kids. You're married. You need to move out. Oh, I want my bedroom back, Jason. I want my... You, you, you and your wife sit. Well, I'm fed up with sleeping in the living room. Oh, Dad. Don't... Oh. And we had a little wrestle. And then... That's it, I moved out. <laughs> the little wrestle. We didn't have a little wrestle. I don't wrestle. I never really wanted to get you know, wrestling. Like I did martial arts and when I was younger, when I was a kid, I was as, as an adult I can't even get my words out today, it must be my brain. And as an adult, but when I was a kid I went to judo just to have a look and I just didn't want to get that close to people because they just like really it's a bit too intimate you know that's no not really my thing it's basically for me judo is dancing with somebody that you don't like you know, dance with someone that you're trying to push over. So I didn't do it. Wrestling. I think we had a little wrestling at school, a little bit. And again, I just... The idea of uh, just just thinking about it, just being, just touching another sweaty man, just or sweaty boy at that time, but just just didn't appeal to me. Just like uh, no, no thanks. I'm just gonna stand in the corner and spin around for a bit, like Wonder Woman. what I was quite good at at school in sports it wasn't sports but it was in the like gymnastics thing and we used to have uh, it's really weird I still remember the gym I've been in quite a few gyms you know, with the different martial arts but this was the gym at school they had two gyms it's a big old place one was for uh, like basketball, netball, football, like indoor stuff. And the other side, there was a big gym that was for uh, like gymnastics and such. It also had uh, ropes hanging down. And, and I used to love that. I used to love climbing up the ropes. And 
and I used to be able to do it just with my upper body without um, using my feet or my legs or anything. I don't mean I didn't, I mean, no one used to climb up upside down, I'm not saying anyone did that, but um, I used to be able to just climb up just using my, my hands, which I was quite pleased about, because for me that showed that I was strong. And then Simon pointed out, but you don't weigh anything. I said, yeah, I suppose, but I don't know if that is, is that, is that a, a, a thing to put into, is that a variable? I don't know. It's, yeah, I might have only weighed about seven stone or eight stone, but it'd be no different if I was doing it now at 15 stone. I wouldn't be able to, well, I understand it puts more pressure, but my arms are a lot stronger now than they used to be. My upper body's stronger than it was when I was a kid. So I wonder, I'd like to get hold of, if there was no one around, and there was a big kind of like net underneath, just in case I kind of lost my grip, I'd love to have a go at climbing up a rope. I'd use my hand. I'd use my feet as well, though. I wouldn't just use my my hands. But I'd love to see if I was able to still do it. Now, Andre, Andre, not Andre, my boy, but Andre, who my boy is named after. In, I think it was in Leighton. Or was it in... It was in a park. In East London. So I'm not sure what park it was. God, there used to be a park. Wow. Because I never used to go to it. But used to go... Yeah, to go to Stratford. Go to... Wow, I've got the visuals of it. So if you go down, if you come at my house, the last place I lived, go out, turn right, then turn right again, then turn left, and you get to Maryland Station, train station, turn right, walking this is not, you can go by car, but... Um, I always walked apart from those times that I didn't as so you go round just follow the road round and that would then lead there's now a supermarket on the left but there wasn't at that time I don't know what was there I think it might have just been waste ground or a car park or something and then you keep going up and there's a pub and it's basically opposite Stratford shopping centre like the original shopping centre not the big new one that they've got and this is basically as you walk down on the right hand side of the road where the shopping centre is there was a few always there I mean it's changed over the years because you know I'm talking about 90 early 90s so it had what did it have right just as you got near to the entrance of the shopping centre there was a pizza place uh, it might be Pizza Hut I don't know but it was like a restaurant. Well, it wasn't like a restaurant. It actually was a restaurant. And I think there was a bank next to that, or a cash point machine, something like that. On the corner, there was a shoe shop. 
And the reason I know that is because I used to date a girl that was friends with someone at Osh. I think she worked in there. Like, just kind of was friends. Kind of dated her, but for a very short time. And then we were friends for a while. This is very early 90s. And then... turning right into the shopper centre because opposite there opposite the shoe shop I think there was so I may be getting this wrong I might be having it might have changed and I might be getting it the wrong way around but I am pretty sure that opposite used to be some kind of clothes shop or something now it's a McDonald's but it wasn't a McDonald's when I lived there. I'm pretty sure it didn't. The McDonald's didn't start, didn't open up there until long after I'd moved out. Because so I moved out of London in 2001. So I'm pretty sure it wasn't there then. But it's there now. Because if it had been there then, I would have, I would have been going there very regularly it would have been because for me one of my little treats that I had for myself was to go into the West End on a sometimes it was a Saturday afternoon sometimes it was a Sunday so I'd get myself a travel card I'd go into I'd go to Tottenham Court Road Tube Station from Stratford on the central line and it's I don't know how many stops it is what is it um, Stratford Mile End uh, Bethnal Green Bank I think Liverpool Street I might have it in the wrong way maybe I think it's something like that or oh, maybe Liverpool Street then Bank and then a couple of others and then Oxford Circus and Tottenham Court Road so I might have missed a, a couple out there but it's it's not not a long journey unless you need to go to the toilet and it's a very long journey so it's uh, yeah so I used to go there and I kind of had this little routine I don't mean like a, a song and dance thing you know I wasn't busking or anything like that but I just used to go into the up a, I generally used to go out the same exit every time and then I would walk around to where the bookstores were and at that time there was there was a bookstore opposite Virgin because there used to be a big Virgin a big HM, HMV stores opposite one of the entrances to uh, Liverpool, uh, Tottenham Court Road tube station and then next to that there used to be a big McDonald's and then round the corner there was loads of stuff like uh, theatres and and I love it actually I still do just thinking about it I'm a big fan of uh, the West End it's the best place to go um, just everything you want's there ideally you do need a bit of money though not lots of money but you know I, used to, I didn't used to go with much money but enough to buy a book and you know but I used to like the atmosphere. Leicester Square. 
I've spent many evenings at Leicester Square on my own early hours of the morning on a Saturday night and packed full full of people uh, people uh, just anything you can imagine back then would be going on there'd be street performers but that's uh, of course that's going on during the day as well but then there'd be preachers there'd be people standing on a uh, a little box uh, talking about something and there'd be people arguing with each other and discussing and and then of course they'd, well of course but if you've not been there there's lots of uh, nightclubs and uh, bars and places that you can get something to eat it's very vibrant very open and they say that if you go to if you go to one of the casinos in America that you don't realize what time of the day it is because of the air conditioning and it's you know the they make it so it's it feels like it's daytime the whole time and you lose track of what time it is well on Leicester Square early hours of the morning on a Saturday I'd lose track of what time it was it just didn't seem as if it was night time because it was so bright so many lights so many people so much I guess so much noise music and rarely saw any any anything other than people just having fun and then I used to get the I think I'd walk to Leicester not Leicester Square to um, what's it called Trafalgar Square I go to Trafalgar Square and then get a bus the night bus back because what I would be doing I'd be probably at a comedy club on a Saturday night and occasionally I'd be a little bit too far away from home to get back in time or I might just fancy doing something you know because I've never really been into nightclubs been in nightclubs uh, with friends because they wanted to go but just like general nightclubs with uh, music and kind of that's it people dancing in the dark and um, I mean I've been loads of times I suppose technically I, when I was younger but I wasn't really my thing it was uh, yeah I didn't really like it I didn't and I suppose I'm not a big fan of crowds that condensed inside a room outside it's not so, it's kind of not really too much of an issue uh, or it wasn't you know so like Trafalgar's or Leicester Square there'd be thousands and thousands of people but it was it was still outside but inside like a, a dark room full of people banging into each other and oh no not really my thing um I kind of wish it had been because I might have uh, had more experiences of uh, interest perhaps so what I used to like to do I'd go to uh, where was it Tottenham Court Road Tube Station and I'd turn right 
and I'll go down. See, I lose track. So you've got Oxford Street, Charing Cross Road, and Tottenham Court Road. So I think it's Charing Cross Road that was where the bookshops were. I think. And not the, not the only road where the bookshops were, but uh, foils at that time was definitely the biggest bookshop in the country it might have been one of the biggest bookshops in Europe possibly the world and possibly the oldest bookshop in the world it's like a really old old bookshop and it's a huge building and I think there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six or seven floors or something like that and I've refurbished it so it's much more I've not been in there for years but it was much more like a normal bookshop now but back then there was books that had been on the shelves for years and years and not been touched and you don't get that in a an, an average bookshop you know normally I think a bookshop if they don't sell the book they kind of probably due to I guess space saving space they'll get rid of that book and put another book in that maybe will sell well there was this whole section that I went in because at the time um, when I first started going in there, early 90s, had no interest in hypnosis, psychotherapy, anything like that. That wasn't that wasn't even on my radar. I was interested in psychology, uh, a little bit of therapy actually. I did I did read uh, the autobiography of uh, Sigmund Freud when I was I think 17. So I was interested due to my own brain because I've always <laughs> my own brain I've always felt different I always felt somehow disconnected with others and when I was younger and I kind of couldn't figure it out like what what's going on why you know there'd be times not just as a child as an adult as well where I'd be talking to someone and I'll just run out of things to say and I'd just be looking at them <laughs> and it would be very awkward and didn't have that um, didn't have that natural interest in them that natural interest to ask about them you know, how are they what are they doing to ask them about their life I didn't have that uh, inquisitive mind about them it was just I wasn't it wasn't I didn't care I just didn't care I didn't I did I wasn't interested. Didn't mean I didn't care about the person. You know, I just uh didn't know how to have human interactions. And that's the good thing about when you're a kid is you pretty much I think always find another kid that you can be friends with who won't care what you like as long as you're we well, even some of the most horrible worst behaving kids have got friends and I was a weird kid I was I didn't I didn't behave well but I wasn't like terrible I don't think really um, <laughs> you know I didn't didn't really break any major laws but I was probably quite rude when I was at school probably 
yeah yeah that's true but just just the way I was back then but that was me yeah but anyway the I did have friends but I used to push them I used to say stuff that upset people and I didn't mean to uh, I was just it's like I seem to have no barrier no boundary no no rules it's like the, there were no rules for me and I had to learn those rules and I'm probably much I'm a lot better these days than I ever used to be but I still I still don't have that natural interest in people which seems to be I don't know seems to be kind of a human inbuilt skill or thing where you, you know oh and just hello how are you but actually want to hear how they are and want details and I don't know maybe that's in order so they can tell the old person about themselves maybe I don't know but the amount of times I used to go to work and someone would say to me oh how was your weekend I was like uh, uh. I was just I don't, I don't care it's, the weekend's gone now I've, so I wasn't I didn't particularly want to talk about my weekend and I definitely wasn't going to ask them about theirs because I didn't the weekend's gone it's like you know I've had people actually ask me oh, what did you have for dinner last night what do you really ask me what I had for dinner last night yeah well I had so you know it's, I think it's because they want to tell me what they had for dinner I've never been bored enough to want to know what someone's had for dinner ever I've never been that that in need of human contact so that I need to know what's in their tummy in just in a conversation wise listening to someone talk about it might be different but not in an interaction necessarily not when I'm at work. Not when I'm in a jacuzzi. Or in a sauna. Thinking I'm on my own. And then someone. Some man says. So what did you have for dinner. Last night. What did you have for dinner. What do you want for dinner tonight. Like. Oh dad. What are you doing here. Not saunas are weird because I actually have been in a sauna and not known that someone was in there. And all I can say is, for for at least three seconds, I was incredibly proud of that fart that I let off. You know, I was having a good old giggle. then you know I hear someone's voice what did you have for dinner last night it's like oh not you again it's kind of um, it's a really good bookshop foils there was this section I used to go into and it was basically um 
I suppose psychology slash religion slash spirituality kind of thing so I used to be really into Buddhism books Buddhist books uh, Zen as well as the what was the Japanese Buddhism that's Zen isn't it but in, as well as the poetry as well as the I was quite into the new Kadampa tradition, which is the forest monks, I think. So I used to read them books. And as I said, I was really into that. I was also really into the beat generation. So reading Kerouac, Ginsberg, um, William Burroughs and then you know a lot of the late the anti-bomb poets from the 60s and you know it's powerful stuff then I got into Bob Dylan I used to listen to his music and then uh, became very interested in Charles Bukowski so I used to buy his books uh, his poetry and his his fiction as well and he's still one of my favourite writers and I've got quite a few of his books here but I've not touched them not looked at them yet because I've already read them in the past so it's really weird you know if I had every single book going back to when I was a kid and I don't mean that uh, Jack and Ori book which I used to have I used to have a Jack and Ori book I had that when I was had that when I was in the children's home in South End or maybe it was in Newcastle I don't know one of those because uh, I was in two possibly I was in three I might have been one in Scotland but I know it's definitely in South Newcastle and South End. But I had this book and I got it from a jumble sale that we had that the, the children's home was having, I guess, to raise money for new rulers for their nuns. I don't know, something like that. And new <laughs> wooden sticks. Um, and this book... I need to I need to one day get hold of that book and just to reread it because I think it will just blow my mind you know just to reread something that I used to read over and over and over again when I was little I was what five five you know it's five or something absolutely loved that book that was my favorite book and at the beginning, at the very first page, it had um, a little rhyme. And I remember that rhyme is embedded in my brain. And it's only a very short rhyme, but it's... Uh, oh, what is it again? Oh, yeah. Here's a story by Jack and Ori. Here's another by Jack... Well, I can't do it probably now. Here's a story by Jack and Ori. Here's another by Jack and his brother. So that was the rhyme. That was the, the first. I think maybe that's what it is. Why I quite liked. I quite liked poetry and rhymes. And when I was a kid. Because perhaps reading them. Maybe that's just. I used to write quite a lot of poems, even when I was in me as an adult. But I don't have any. I don't have any of them anymore. I haven't written anything for years, like poetry. 
everything I do now is just verbal, you know. Perhaps I should look at writing a poem and seeing what comes out. If I had all those books anyway, going all the way back to when I was a kid, and all the books that I bought when I was an adult, all the, you know, all the Buddhist books, philosophy books, psychology books, poetry, plus all the hypnosis, psychotherapy, counselling. I had a library on chronic pain as well. I had lots of books on chronic pain, lots of books on massage, aromatherapy, reflexology, the various counselling as well, various different subjects that I've studied over the years. And NLP is another one, another subject. And uh, as well as, you know, just books for fiction that I've um, read. I would have thousands of books. Thousands. You know, this whole wall, every wall of this flat would be covered in books. You know, if I had bookshelves, on every wall they would be covered full of books which I would like very much that would be groovy really would be groovy so I'd like to do that one day when I first moved in here well not first of all but pretty much quite early on I decided to try and get back some of those books that I used to read when I was younger you know, just for nostalgic senses, you know. And I have, I've got a few of them back. Like the Wilt books, um, Sapphire and Steel. Although I've not read it yet. I've read it, I did read it when I first got it, when I was a kid. I loved that book. I loved it, and I loved the show. But I loved the book as much as I loved the show. And especially as the the book could do more than a show could because of like the special effects and stuff. Because back in the early eighties, we didn't have like for television a great a great amount of special effects. Um, what other books have I got? Yeah, I've got like quite a few self-help books. I was really into, well, still am really, but like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, The Path Less, tr- The Road Less Travelled, um, Men Are From Venus, Mars Are From Women, and what's the other one? Uh... I don't, know if I don't know if I got it. Seven Deadly Habits or Seven Habits of Successful People. Um, yeah, so, and I, so I kind of replaced a few books that I used to have. Uh, so there's still a lot more. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds to get. But after a while of getting them, I kind of just kind of stopped just I don't know know, maybe I lost interest in trying to get back what I'd lost but still would like them just I've always been a lover of books you know since a very early age loved books loved television (laughs) it's the two things that I really liked um, which is quite weird that it's because they're kind of two very opposite things, really, but in some ways. And so, anyway, I'll quickly, quickly, I'll slowly, as we're talking, slowly. So, foils was on the right hand side, opposite foils, or there was. I think there was two bookshops, but two really big, big bookshops. 
There was one called Blackwell's, and I don't think that's there anymore. It might be. It's a little bit further up. And it had a lot, and I mean a lot of... Uh, Oh, what's the right word? Educational books. You know, it used to have books for, even for surgeons. You know, sort of how to do operations. And it was really very, well, that was that in foils. I think it might, I'm sure it was in Blackwell's. And, uh, you know, they actually printed their own books, Blackwell's. So it's a famous bookshop, and I guess it's been there for a long time. I'm not sure if it's still there, though. And they also sold, like, regular books as well. But they had a lot of uh, psychotherapy, uh, psychoanalysis, counselling books that they printed themselves and I love all that stuff I really do I really really you know that's why I wish that I could live forever so that I could read every single book every book on psychotherapy and uh, I love it I do I love it I love it and um I looked at some of the surgical books and I thought, I don't love it, I don't like it at all, and I put them back. And they were, some of them books were hundreds of pounds, really expensive books. Even just the basic, not basic, but like the nurse manual was really expensive. And it's like, wow. Well, that's a lot of money. I think the most expensive book I ever got was... Yeah, I don't have it anymore. It was a chronic pain book. And it was... I think it was £60. But I have got a book which I, I spent £25 on in probably 1993. Still got it. It's the only book I've still got since those years. So it's lived with me for 20, what's it, 26 years. So it's the only book I've still got. I've replaced books. And I used to have a Lenny Bruce book as well. Uh, like, but, and that used to like, accompany me with the, it's the teachings of the Buddha. Those two books used to follow me everywhere. But along the way, I lost the Lenny Bruce book. But the teachings of Buddha, it's got an orange cover, and it cost me £25, and the label, the price label, is still inside the sleeve. And I bought it, as I said, about 1993, maybe 92, but around 93. £25 was a lot of money for a book then. For me, it's a lot of money for a book now. But back then, I mean, my rent was £40 a week. So I basically spent more than a half of a week's rent on a book now my rent is I've got very cheap rent but it's 80 83 pound or 84 pound a week so it's literally like spending what 50 pound on a book now which is it's too much for a book 50 pound that's a lot of money. But £25, 1993. I still got the book. Still in excellent condition. And yeah, I don't know why I'm telling you that. I just 
thought I'd let you know. I've got one, it's the only thing I've got other than my body. The only item, possession that I have from the early 90s. In fact, we can skip through the years. up to yeah pretty much there's been quite a few occasions where I've ended up with not a lot or I've given stuff away or whatever so yeah that's the one thing I've got that one book that I've had for for some people it would be a lifetime wouldn't it 26 years and it's in my bedroom on the bookcase and I've got a uh, a little plastic joke pretend poo on top of it no I haven't I haven't I haven't but it's uh, yeah it's there But what I used to do, I used to like to go to the bookshops. I didn't always buy a book. I didn't always have money to buy a book. But I'd go in anyway. I used to like to just look. I liked the atmosphere of these big, big bookshops. You know, going to a little bookshop, it just, I don't enjoy that. But going to a big, big bookshop, I like that. And, uh, if I did buy a book I would you know, or even if I didn't I'd end up going to McDonald's the you know, the one opposite the entrance to Tottenham Court Road Station and next to Virgin huge Virgin store I was quite surprised how big the entrance was and um, the The McDonald's, the McDonald's, and um, I'd always have the same thing: quarter pounder of cheese, fries. Well, I, I I call them chips, but you really have to call them fries. And I'd have a milkshake, strawberry or banana, usually banana. I'd go downstairs, eat that, have the drink, maybe have a little look at the books while I'm doing that. And then I get home, get onto the tube, get back to Stratford, walk from Stratford to my house, and then I just relax for the evening. So I'd had my dinner, had my even meal, didn't need to eat now for the rest of the day, and I just maybe watch some telly or read one of the books. And that used to be my Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon. Not every Saturday or Sunday, but every now and then, you know. Another thing I used to do before I go is when I was in London, I never worked on my birthday. Never ever worked on my birthday. I worked on my birthday when I was young. I didn't like it. So I decided now I was going to have the day off on my birthday, which I pretty much have done pretty much ever since. And uh, I had this thing every birthday I would go into the West End, I would entreat myself, I'd go in there, I'd perhaps watch a movie. Uh, the cinema or you know I just go buy a book a couple of books have something to eat and just spend a few hours just walking around and maybe go to Leicester Square watch some people doing you know the shows and stuff I did that for years 
that was my little routine that I did on my birthday just to celebrate my birthday just me and myself so that's it for today's let me bore you to sleep thank you very much for listening and I will see you next time bye bye Bye-bye.